dysfunctional wing nuts, dysfunctional. Um, I would, well, Steve Pfeiffer next, but I'm going to tell a little story that might relate to Steve Pfeiffer's story. Art Loff was one of the better writers who I believe in 1950, 49 or 50 was the national champion. 1950, he went to Mexico and rode the Tour of Mexico. He won the ninth stage, which put him in the leader role. That night, management um, assigned uh, hotel rooms, and um, nobody could figure out what hotel room was his, so he was not awakened for the next day and was not thereby allowed to, to finish the event. Now I'd like to introduce Steve Pfeiffer, who was a San Francisco raised guy who rode a lot of track and road. Uh, Steve, please. <coughs> Hi, everybody. No. <laughs> okay, I'll go, go back to the start of all this, which is kind of what this is all about. In San Francisco, where I grew up in, oh, I probably about 1950, 51, I had a three-speed. And I rode to San Jose and back, have a lunch, come back. I did this a lot. That's 100 miles. I was just a kid. Of course, now you'd be m killed immediately by the traffic. <laughs> but I did this for a long time. And then in uh, 52, in junior in high school, I ran into Jim Manning. We were on the track team. I was a long distance runner, and he was a hurdler. <coughs> Jim lives here. I thought he'd be here, but he's been here 30 years teaching. Anyway, he starts talking about racing at the velodrome. And I go, racing? I didn't know they raced bicycles. Just I knew I could go for a long ride. So he takes me on a training ride, and in about two miles, I can't even see him anymore. He's so far away. So I go right away, I go up to Oscar Jr.'s bike shop and I got myself a 10 speed, an Allegro, and kind of got into it. And, <coughs> um, and as, as has been mentioned, actually, there was San Jose and us, Bay Area, but we, the San Jose guys were the big, older, fast guys, and we were the mostly young kids up in San Francisco. And we had a nice bunch of us. We, um, the, two, the two courses we ran, which has kind of been referred to, the polo fields actually were polo fields. They had polo games there every weekend. And around the outside of this thing was a narrow little, might have been 10 feet wide, but I don't think so. And uh, a cyclone fence on the outside. If you fell, it would just grind you along this fence. And it did. That was our track. And Lake Merced, which later on was the scene of the Olympic trials in 56, that was our road course. So we had all our club races there, once in a while some big ones, and we mixed with the guys in San Jose, which we were stunned, trying to stick on their wheels. These are guys, there was one guy who had been on a 32 Olympic team. Admittedly, he was getting pretty old by this time, but he was better than we were. And there's Don Peterson and the Gattos and Road Brothers. I mean, it was a who's who of national quality riders. And we're sort of going, hmm, okay. You know, it worked out. And Oscar Jr., as I say, had the bicycle shop. He was a six-day rider from the 30s. And he had retired since. And he bought this bicycle shop in the early 40s. And that became the headquarters. Well, he created the San Francisco Wheelman. And a lot of our meetings were in the basement of his shop. And eventually, San Francisco, there was only San Francisco Wheelman in, in San Jose. You know, we're going to this beginning of all this. And out of our San Francisco group became Berkeley Wheelman. Pete was, Pete was part of ours. Ricky Bronson down the peninsula. Pretty soon these other clubs branched out. San Jose was always there. But uh, pretty soon we had like five or six clubs in the area. <coughs> and uh, 56 Olympic trials. I was going to go to England with Harry Backer and Rudy, and uh, I applied. I was a machinist apprentice at the shipyard at the time, and I applied for a leave of absence to go train for the Olympics. And of course, they made it easy for me. They said, Steve, you're either going to be an Olympic, a bicycle rider or a machinist. Okay, I quit. <laughs> so <laughs> that was easy. Went up to Vancouver where they'd had this wonderful big 250 meter board track, the only one in North America at the time. And to train, you know, to get in shape, to go with Harry and, and his buddy to uh, Europe. And I had so goddamn much fun up there. It's a marvelous track. All the international riders are all there because the track is there. And I wrote to Larry, Harry and I said, well, I'm having 
I didn't say I'm having a good time, but I said, I just don't think I can go with you. So they said, well, okay, we originally it was only going to be me and Rudy anyway. So they went off and had their summer, R rode the worlds, I guess. I didn't know they rode the worlds till he mentioned it tonight. There was very few, well, the next year, Dave and I, we'd been pal, he walked into a bicycle shop where I was sweeping the floors to make, get tires for my bicycles. He and Dan Calgen, both 13 years old, wanted to, you know, wondering about bicycles. I guess I missed a part of it. I didn't know there was any bicycle racing, had no idea until I met Jim Manning in high school. And I don't want to say that if I didn't meet him, I never raced bicycles. But these two kids had an idea. This is three years later. And uh, no, a couple of years later. I was about 17 and Dave was 13. And uh, three years later, Dave is national champion. So he obviously had some talent. And we rode together quite a bit, trained together. Went to Europe. Matter of fact, the summer of 55, we went up to North America, to Vancouver, and we both broke the national record for the 1,000 meters. I said, oh, this is good. This is good. We're going to kill him in the Olympic trials. Well, we both had a bad day or something. We, didn't, we weren't even close. But then the next spring, somehow out of this, we said, well, we'll go to Europe. Because kind of as has been mentioned, the money part is zero. Uh, if we go to Europe, maybe if we're good enough, we can learn to, you know, get a little bit of money somehow, have a good time. So we, Dave was young enough, we had to wait till he graduated from high school to leave. <laughs> so we left in early June, and we were just going to go about like what Harry and Rudy did, go over there for the summer, ride with Reg Harris at Manchester, maybe go to the continent for a little while, and then come home at, at the end of the summer. Well, we did this, and Reg took us in, had dinner at his house quite a bit, and then the guy that managed the the, fa the, the track there at uh, Fallowfield in Manchester was Reg's personal manager. And he had already arranged a, a uh, bed and breakfast for us, close enough that we could walk to the track. And uh, it was, I mean, we were like starstruck kids. We'd raced in Vancouver, which is international, but somehow going to Europe. And the, and the game was we'd went, we went to England first on purpose because Reg was inviting us. He said, well, they're faster than we are we being the Americans, and then we'll go to the continent and try to work it from there. And I said, we, we went to Liège in Belgium and rode the world championships, and uh, we were, that was going to be really going to be it. Summer's over, we're going to go home. And we met this Belgian sprinter who was, you know, very friendly and spoke really good English. And his parents, his dad said he learned English by hiding GIs in the basement during the war. His English was pretty good. <laughs> So anyway, this guy, Jean Gouverts, he, uh, he convinces us we've got to stay for the winter and ride the indoor season in Antwerp. And we thought, shit, that sounds nice. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we did that. Well, what we mean, and immediately after the Worlds, we didn't do very good, of course. We didn't know what we were doing, really. Um, I had already written to Cinelli, and I got on a train and rode down to Milano and got my road bike. He was building my road bike. While we were still in Manchester, Dave brought his bike over with him from the States, but I had the guy that built, a lot of this stuff was kind of undercover, if you will, but the guy that built Reg Harris's bikes, even though he's riding for Raleigh, Raleigh didn't build on the bikes, they financed him. This guy built the bikes and they put Raleigh's name on him. He built me a track bike. So I had a very nice track bike, went down to Milano and got a road bike, and uh, rode through Italy, through Switzerland, over the Alps, up into Germany, and out joined Dave and Bill Best at uh, Nuremberg, where Bill was stationed in the Army. And we, we just trained with them a little bit and then zip over up, to Lua, up to Liège to uh, go to the, to the indoor circuit. I see. And that was incredible. W I had written to a lot of promoters. You, this, we stumbled into all this. We knew about Harris, and that was it. Everything else was just blindfolded. But I wrote to promoters in Zurich, Denmark, all over the place, seeing if we could race during the winter. And in those days, the difference between amateurs and professionals was enormous. Promoters didn't, didn't give a rip about you. If you're an amateur, <laughs> come back when you turn pro. Then we can promote you. So, but Antwerp was different. We could ride seven days a week if we wanted to. We could race two or three times a week. And then they always had major races on Friday or Saturday nights. And Van Stiebergen was basically the local hero. And they had a ton of, I mean, Belgium was loaded with fabulous riders, and they all raced there in the wintertime. I mean, we were like in a goldfish bowl of superheroes, plus we're having a great time. 
So this, the winter season's over, and we said, well, no use going home. Then it was a, we went back down to Italy. Again, this was kind of stumbling. The Chinelis did help us, for sure, but most, most of Europe is very far north. We didn't know. I mean, Rome is roughly equal to Seattle, so all of Europe is further north than that. So it's, in the wintertime, it's cold. It's mostly covered with snow. So everybody that could, especially smaller professional teams, would go down to the Riviera. So between Genoa and uh, Monte Carlo was resorts all over the place. But during the winter, they're empty. So cyclists could stay there for peanuts, relatively speaking, peanuts. And so we'd get out. Of course, the training is you go out there, turn left, and go this way, go out and turn right this way, because you couldn't go inland because it's snow again. But we had a marvelous six weeks or so there, and then we went back to Milano, and Cinelli arranged for us to ride a couple of races. And we, he hooked us up with the FAMA team, which, of course, that year, Charlie Gall won the tour for FAMA. I've still got a FAMA jersey <laughs> and a sweatshirt. And uh, it, it was a too bad. There was a little misunderstanding because Cinelli was sure we were going to stay all summer. And we never said we were going to. And by the way, Cinelli didn't speak any English, but his wife, Heidi, who was Swiss, translated everything. So he was kind of disappointed when we left because we were kind of hooked up in England and we just knew... Well, backing up a little bit, we really, truly were not interested in road racing. We were track riders. Dave was a sprinter, a really, really good sprinter. And we rode a lot of Madison races together, especially in uh, uh, Antwerp. And Br we'd go down on the train ride in Brussels, only 20 miles away. And we'd ride Madison, and he'd just whip our butts. These are 20-kilometer races, 12 miles, and we get lapped twice, three times. I mean, when we were over here, we were pretty damn good. And we went home. You know, I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit, but Dave gets us on the Pan Am team. I, get, I did too. I got the I won the California Road Racing Championships. When the games were over, I set the the uh, broke the hour record on that track, and that was kind of funny because it was an awful awful time. But the track was going to be torn down the next day, and I was in the best shape of my life. We kind of talked about riding with the Army. The five of there was five. The Army put five of us together. It was Hartman, Tetzloff, Pete Bowl and another guy. Anyway, the five of us, they put us together, three of us got on the team. So their gamble was good. <coughs> so, I don't know if, I guess, okay, I can kind of segue into the Pan American Games now. That was the best of all worlds and the worst of all worlds. And I don't want to exactly bad mouth the ABL because they kept cycling going, but they made some horrible, horrible, abominable decisions. This thing about Islip, uh, riding the Olympic trials out in New York was one. And uh, the, the plus was the first major race is a four-man pursuit, and our guys win it. The first time, I'm pretty positive, the first time an American team had ever won an international event since, like, 1912. Never won anything. I never got a gold medal, at least. Well, Jack Hyde got third in the world in 49. That was a huge breakthrough. This is better. Not only do they get the four-man the, uh, four pursuit, then uh, Disney gets second in the sprint. A little bit controversial, but he did, and he'd never placed that high. I met an Englishman later on that Disney put him out in the uh, Australian Olympics. <laughs> and any, and uh, Alan Bell won the kilometer, which was another horrible thing. It was, it's, I mean, we're, we're all, all of us had our eyes open like, the hell with all these continental rider, inter South American riders, Pan American games. And Alan was like, you know, there's A personalities and B personalities. Alan's like a triple A. He was wired all the time, ready to go. He was a sprinter. So he's the, he's the number one guy riding the, riding the kilometer. And uh, we, we, somebody on our team would hold Alan. Now, of course, you've seen him. They have mechanical things that when the gun goes off, they let him go. So this guy's holding Alan. And he's lunging at the pedals. He's like Jim a, Rossi's like a, oh, Jim Rossi's dad. Okay, Jim Rossi was one of the pursuit riders, and his dad's the guy that's holding Alan. Well, Alan's lunging forward, and actually, uh, Rossi's dad is pulling him backward when the gun went off, just minusculely, but you can see it. He's going backwards when the gun goes off. Well, he takes off. The Argentine coach immediately protests Alan. He was moving when the gun went off. 
We went, well, yeah, but he was moving the wrong way. And of course, they didn't video anything that would have solved it, but that was years later. So there was screaming and protesting. I mean, Alan won it. I forget what the times were, but they, he won it, and Dave Staub got third, and two riders. So it's all over. The uh, interject. Sure. Fired the gun after. Oh. And saw that he had the chassis. Oh. I didn't remember that part. I was there, as obviously was Pete, but uh, yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah, there was quite a few of us that are here now were there, but I, you know, some of the details, screaming and hollering, and I talked to the, we knew George Thorpe pretty well and some of the other officials, and I was talking to him, and they said, you got to rescue Alan. He won the goddamn race. Well, we don't want to start an international incident, and I was about to tear my hair out or deck them. We don't, we'll let Alan be disqualified because we don't want to start an international incident, and I will never forget those words. I'm sitting there listening to that. Are you kidding me? This is the biggest thing Alan's ever done. Probably will the bigger the, was the biggest thing he ever did do. And he won it, got a gold medal. Would it, well, he would have, and then he threw him out. Out. So the gold goes to this Argentinian who was second. Staub at least moves from third up to second. Well, that was pretty hard to swallow. I mean, like, here's, this is the best we've ever done. The four guys get a gold. Disney gets a, a silver. Alan gets first place, and they throw him out. And we go, oh, Jesus. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I guess I did forget one fair incident. When, when Dave and I were in Europe, we went over there just for the summer. That's all we were going to do, basically what Harry did. And we got convinced to come ride in the winter. And the next week, s uh, spring, Cinelli hooks us up with some rides in Italy. We went back to England, had the greatest time. <coughs> rode the world, the world of Worlds in uh, Liège, Belgium in 57. And that was new. We'd never been anywhere where they didn't speak English. And so, and it was kind of hard. They spoke, Northern Belgium speaks Flemish, Southern speaks French. So we're there. We got there early because we'd never seen these great, these huge, these tracks in Europe are monsters, 450, 500 meters, great monstrous things. They were almost like riding the road. And uh, we went early just to practice on it and got a bed and breakfast half a block from the track. And uh, the, the first heats, I mean, we were during all this practicing is when we met the Belgian sprinter that convinced us to come to Antwerp for the winter. So in the, fir the first heats, or there's hundreds of them, because everybody sends a bunch of riders. <coughs> so we're split with they, they got it all geared out, so we can get our breakfast in the morning. The heats are going to start it. 8.30, 9 o'clock, whatever, and they'd be over in two hours. Well, it rained a little bit, stop, get dry. Ride two or three more heats, rain, stop, dry. So it was after 11, 11.30, and everybody's feeding schedule is screwed by this time. And this guy, whoever it was, comes around talking to us all. We're just sitting on the grass, and he's speaking in French, and I thought I knew French pretty well, a, a little. Not enough, obviously. So he's... To me, he's saying, okay, we're going to take about a one-hour break. Everybody can go off get lunch, come back here, and we'll continue on. Okay, so I go down half a block to our bed and breakfast, and I get a sandwich and a glass of lemonade, and I walk back, and I hear the crowd is yelling. I was like, oh, mm hmm. Walk in, and here's this Irishman that we became very friendly with. I later on introduced him to his uh, future wife. They immigrated to Canada, and when I used to race a 24-hour up near there, near Toronto, and I'd go, always go and stay with them, and they loved me 30 years later, and I said, oh, I guess it's been good. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, I had missed my heat. It's like, I don't know, I don't know what this guy said in French. It, he was very specific, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and I don't, apparently they never took the break. So I missed my race. And the next day, of course, they're having more heats. And uh, uh, Carl, Carl, uh, Carl Melby, Kurt Melby, was the Belgian, uh, Dutch, Belgian, no, excuse me, Dane, that I was supposed to ride against. So he comes up to me in the infield. We're just sitting around watching the race. And he says, Steve, where were you yesterday? I thought I was going to ride against you. Looking forward to riding against you. So I just kind of relayed it kind of quickly that, you know, well, I went off and had lunch. And, and uh of course, there's people all over the place. And the guy standing next to me says, "Did I understand you 
missed your race because you went and had a sandwich? And I says, yeah. Well, that's the end of it. Well, it, went, it made the front page of the sporting San Francisco Chronicle green. And people are calling my mother from all over the country. Is that your son? <laughs> was, he the, was he the screw up? <laughs> Oh, missed, a, missed part of it. Sorry. Um, the guy over there. That um, guy. The Victor Vincenti of America. Stand up, please, so we can see. Um, and that was <laughs> Thank you. In those days, he went by the name Michael Giltner. And at age 18. At age 18, he... Um, blew everybody off by uh, winning the Tour of St. Lawrence, which was a damn hard event, um, 59, right? The following year, um, uh, kind of uh, convoluted by Olympic team uh, stipulations, however, uh, we put together, got to understand that in those years, there was no national organization of, na there was no American organization uh, organizing international teams. You just sort of put your own event together. And we had a team of five riders from California, of whom Nick Van Mael was one. I had ridden that event twice before, but Nick was the better rider that year. And uh, Steve uh, was our team manager. Steve was trying to help out two teams that year, both our California team and the Army team. Take it from there, Steve. Well, backing up just a little bit, this was like, this is the year after the Pan Am Games. Well, the year. Matter of fact, we had to wait till the trials were over for Tetzloff to get his spot on the team. Seeing we all jump in, I don't remember what we drove, Pete's Volkswagen bus, I think, because we drove that a lot of places because you could put everybody in it. So <clears throat> we zip on up there and 59, 59, yeah, Mike, Mike won it, and I, I rode, and matter of fact, Tetzloff and I got away together on the first or second day, it was a five or seven day race, and, but nobody spoke anything but French, we're way up in northern Canada, so again, French was the problem, if it was a problem, <coughs> but uh, we'd get there, we'd get to the, and they were basically two day races, they'd, they'd start fairly early and go and finish finish at lunchtime in some local town, and then you get a break, a couple hour break, have your lunch or whatever, and then you ride another 30, 40, 50 miles into another town. And this was almost just virtually every day, or once in a while there'd be a criterium. The second half would be a criterium. <coughs> so actually after about the second day, I said, well, every day we'd have to find a hotel, find a motel, find a place to eat in French. It was just a nightmare. And also the roads in those days were awful. The road, we, all, we had bent wheels every night. And I got pictures of me, you know, with my knee bending, straightening people's wheels. Then you get the spoke wrench and you straighten them out. So I was doing that anyway. Finally I said, okay, look, I'm gonna be the manager. I, I dropped out of the race. So I could actually go ahead a little bit and try to find a restaurant and a motel when we got there. And most of the hotels would have a basement where you could hide the bikes, if you will, and that's where I'd bend the wheels and get everything back together. So, but it was the biggest thing ever. I mean, obviously we'd been in Europe, but uh, this was the biggest thing in North America, I think, ever, anywhere. You know, five, six, eight day race. Teams were coming from Europe and Mexico, and uh, the roads were, I mean, it's like somebody's gotta take charge of this thing or control, so that was me. <coughs> And uh, one, of the stages, <laughs> one of the stages went through um, a town called Tetford Mines. I and I remember going through Tetford Mines and there was kind of a rank dusty smell to the town. 30 years later, found out it was called Tetford Mines because they were mining asbestos. <laughs> That's what we were breathing. <laughs> well, 59, let's see, you know, I don't know, 59, Hiltner won it. That was reasonably straightforward. The next year, we're back there, basically the same gang again, the Army, five Army guys, and uh, some California guys, and uh, something like third day, uh, I think either Te Hiltner or Tetzloff were leading, and the ABL, again, this wonderful ABL, had come down to the rule, the trials, the, the, we, the, we'd had the, tr 
there was X number of days before the trial, that's it. No, you can't compete in anything closer than that. So these, they had, I mean, this is a, Mike's the defending champion, and he, I mean, there was tears. All of us were standing there crying in the middle of the road. The promoter's just rambling on, of course, in French about how wonderful these guys have been doing, but they got to stop. I mean, it was like nobody could understand it. I mean, it's like just a, I don't want to say a dumb, stupid, but a, an arbitrary ABL rule. I mean, I don't think any country in the world ever did that, but we did. So we lost our best guys. The, I mean, the rest of us could ride, but the guys that had made the team couldn't. So this was, I, you know, I don't want to badmouth ABL because they did carry us along a long time, but they did some really bizarre things that were sometimes were not explainable. Why they picked this 15-day deadline or whatever the hell it was, I don't know. But <coughs> there was a lot of gritted jaws and and uh, then, of course, the stuff at Islip and then Alan Bell being disqualified. But then Nick got you. Oh, that, that's the point of the oh the, yeah, okay, he led me into this. The last, the last day of that second year, uh, you know, we all, we, we never raced as a team much anywhere. There's no such thing. <coughs> but we did. We helped each other somewhat. I don't remember much in the way of flat tires and that sort of thing, but we helped each other. And uh, Nick Van Mail with a, with half a half a day to go like i said we race in the morning some town then the, the afternoon well nick is leading nick has got this thing won and the the final was a not exactly like up and down the champs elysees for the tour but a, ver a almost a processional thing it was just there's no way nick can lose i think the two stages in a row he got in a kind of a critical breakaway and wasn't particularly noticed because he just wasn't known yeah. But by the end of that <coughs> second day in the breakaway, suddenly he was in the yellow jersey. Yeah. So here we are with at the end of the first day, at the end of the first stage, the last day, <coughs> and I'd found the hotel, found a place to have a quick lunch. They we gave us they gave us like two hours or so between races. <coughs> so I got everybody a room uh, in the hotel because apparently the the criterium or the second stage was going to be right in that same area. So people could stay. We didn't have to worry about zipping them. Because a lot of times you'd have to get on a bus and go to the next stage. Well, this wasn't quite the case. Anyway, I got a nice list from the guy at the desk of all these ten guys, I guess, if that was me still riding, and what room they're in. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. Everybody takes their little two-hour break, and I go around, and I'm waking everybody up. Because I figure, okay, they're taking a nap. Well, Nick doesn't answer. <coughs> And I thought, okay, well, he was a pretty big star at the moment, so the media hooked him up. So he's off somewhere being interviewed. Well, he wasn't. So he went to the start of the, the race, which is, you know, 10 miles away maybe, and Nick isn't there either. I mean, we're all tearing our hair out. Where the hell is Nick? And they start the race. I mean, literally, fire the gun, going, and Nick comes roaring in in a taxi cab, jumps out, got his bike over his shoulder, and he's ready to go. Well, they wouldn't let him start. He wasn't there. That's it. And I got a bunch of the officials together, and I'm almost screaming and yelling, but kind of calm. I said, no, wait a minute. This isn't quite fair. He's willing to take the half a lap loss, you know, let him start and catch up. If he, get, if he can catch up. Oh, no, can't do it. He wasn't there. He's out. So it's like I couldn't believe it. I mean, I've always felt responsible. It wasn't. I mean, the guy that gave me the list of the numbers is the screw-up. But I was the team manager if you will so and there's nothing I could have done if he doesn't answer the door that they say he's in it would have been a sure thing that Nick would have won had that not happened yeah. do you still have that yellow jersey Nick I do <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say he, he probably probably cries probably cries every time he looks at it <laughs> yeah. yeah well thanks yeah. very much we have yeah. um, we still have uh, Ted Ernst, I want to do something that at first I thought was odd, but maybe it's okay. Um, I can quickly read a list of people who are deceased um, with the thought that just hearing these names might trigger some recollection uh, or at least get them on record here for further investigation. Um, uh, Bruce Neiswanger, Claire Young, who just passed away a couple weeks ago, Eugene Portuisi, Joe Colo, Bob Stoffacker, uh, Freddie Hempler, uh, Louis Rondoni, Carol Poe, Red Berti, Wendell Rollins, 
Eddie Rudolph from Chicago, um, Carl Wetberg, Pat DeCalibus, Jim Arbuckle, who died about three years ago, I think, uh, Dave Staub, uh, best friends to those of us. Uh, well, it's been five years uh, since he passed, five, six more, years, more like eight, 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 eight years, wow. Well, um, uh, Avery Brundage died, and uh, we have mixed things to say about that, don't we? Um, <laughs> uh, John Fitzpatrick, um, Herb Francis, Oscar Jr., Perry Metzler, uh, Charlie Morton, Ron Ruby, Ed Rudolph, Harold Kirkbride, Lynn Marshall, Larry Marshall, Mike Walden, Al Stiller, um, Bud Thorpe, uh, George Wolf, uh, Ray Florman, uh, John Finley Scott, uh, Charlie Albert, Gus Hussey, Al Tofield. Now, any of you here that I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> um, Ted Ernst has had a long and very, very, very much varied career and probably the only one in this room who can tell us how it really was in the sixes and much more. Frank Rolando is, is alive. He's um, somewhat limited. Jim, uh, Jim, Rossi. Jim, well, Jim, Jim Rossi did pass away, what, six, seven years ago, I think. <laughs> and, 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 and Lars Zabrowski has passed away. Phil Criswell passed away. Who? John. Don Peterson, whose son Terry is here. Um, well, I just throw those names out. If those names trigger anything in your memory, you can let us know. Ted Ernst. <laughs> You've all suffered through, so now, or maybe not suffered. I learned a lot and had a lot of fun. This was good today. And I'm glad you're all still sitting on. That means you still got the stuff. All right. What I'll try to do is start a little bit earlier and take you back in a little bit more chronological and uh, because so many of these experiences have been really personal and great, I won't dwell too much on anecdotes of my own self, but I'll try to put this together in a context of history and how it all related and to why it happened and how it happened so that it'll give you a little better insight that what all the good people up here said before and some of the comments from, this, uh, from you in the audience that you'll have a handle on how to put this together in your own mind and get a really good sequence of the order and in the feeling of the emotion that it happened in its time frame. Uh, now, many of you may not know this, but my parents came from Germany 1929 uh, during the Depression type time. They were engaged in Germany, married in Chicago in 1930, and then I was born in 1932. Now, my dad had started racing in 1924, so that when he came here, he already had uh, four or five years of racing behind him, and then it took him a while to get a bicycle, and he, which he got uh, in Chicago from Oscar Wasson, I think, or from Emil Goosens, one of the other frame builders, and then he started racing again, like in uh, 32, in that time frame. So that uh, I grew up in the bicycle game, basically, and that gives me an advantage and or then a different insight into the entire sport because many of the fellows here started when they were 13, 14, 15. I started when I was one year old looking at the bicycle track. When I, you know, I was out there looking at the bike, guys riding bike races so that my input is a little earlier era uh, than some of the other fellows. And uh, they built, they had a cement track in Chicago and they also had the uh, dirt track in Kenosha in that time frame. And like was before mentioned, in 34, uh, they built over the cement track in Chicago with the WPA, the Works Project Administration. And then I have the pictures, which I've just now uh, given to Bradley Wool, all my original archive, because he's got this beautiful catalog archive of um, Oscar Jr. He now has the photographs that are contemporary to those albums, and they uh, have pictures of the track in the Burbank, San Jose uh, area being built in 1935. So he has those original photographs, and you can all take a look at them or visit his shop and see how he has that. Now, that'll bring us up to date in the 30s that my dad started his shop in 1934 so that I grew up then in the bicycle shop, and then already by 1938, 39, 40, he, my dad was taking me to the six-day bike races, so I saw a lot of the six-day bicycle professional riders. And as a result then, uh, Peter wanted me to kind of go through 
the 30s into the 40s, how this transition stage and why the riding was so successful uh, in the United States or the lack of success. Uh, especially in Chicago and also in New York, not to a, such a great extent, I think on the West Coast, I wasn't here, you know, and didn't find out enough about that, but did not have the population base that the Midwest area, Chicago area uh, had, and then the New York uh, Eastern area had. And there were many bicycle clubs, they were comprised of first generation and second generation people that were born in Europe and or then had come over as children or then people that just came over from Europe and then started having children in this country to bring them into cycling. So that you had, like in Chicago, the Italian groups had a club like called Mazzini. And then in the Belgium was a, a desk camp cycling club. And then there was a Danish American cycling club that Andrew showed us on the pictures uh, that I brought along. And then not only did you have the clubs that were the ethnic group clubs, but then you had the neighborhood clubs because in those days, in the 30s, there was not a lot of money around and they were also parks in the Chicago area and in the other cities around the large cities in the area. So that uh, there was one club in Chicago called Henry Playground. And then there was another club called Edison Park Wheelman. Well, these were parks in Chicago and areas. South Chicago Wheelman, the geographic area. Lakeshore Wheelman, which was in eastern of Chicago along Lake Michigan. So that you had these different groups that coalesced that got together because at the park field houses, like here in the Civic Center, and the people could meet there, it was inexpensive, and they could do that. In addition to that, they had political clubs, the booster clubs, like Bowler and Barrett, athletic clubs. These were politicians, aldermen, councilmen of the, 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 the counties, or a booster club that would get together and support a candidate. Erickson was a booster club, helped put on the Elgin Chicago bike race for many years. So you had these three major groups that would put uh, the bicycle clubs together. The ethnic groups were not bike clubs as such as much as they were sport clubs. They had socials and dances and get-togethers. They would have roller races in the winter, and then they would have uh, not much soccer ball before the war. The soccer ball and the social clubs came on after the Second World War, and by that time the bike riding uh, had already gone into demise after the Second World War, but soccer ball started coming on. So that with that gives you an idea of where the structure was in addition to a few of the bike shops. Now, what happened during the 30s in the Depression time, and I would suggest that the sport was not dead but there was not much cycling activity on the road, and I'll go into that uh, just a little bit. Uh, but in the 30s, the six-day bike racing was a big deal. And then it was real big in the 20s, and then when the Depression came on after 29 into the 30s, it was the only thing going as a sport in cycling because it was in a stadium, and the people loved it because for one admission, you could stay there all day. It was warm. You could bring your food along, you could sit there, you could eat, you could sleep, you could do whatever you felt like doing, but you were in the stadium and you could see these guys racing and it was just a great, great activity. All the Europeans were there. During the middle of the Depression, guys like Torchy Peden uh, from Canada, uh, Killian Vopel from Chicago, uh, Letourneau from France, and, and Grivetere Brockardo, those guys were making seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars a day in the Depression, in the late 30s. They wanted the other guys to turn pro, the Americans, to, to, to fill in the field, 25, 35, 45 bucks a day. So that was an idea of, gives you a idea of what was up as far as the professional happening was going on. Now, during the war, then all the cycling almost came to a stop. And then uh, Teddy here and, and Harry and the guys, they were talking about how the cycling was held together, and Ernie did uh, in New York. And if it wasn't for Oscar Wasson in Chicago, who was more with the Belgium club, and then my dad, who, although he came from Germany, wasn't really in the German aura, he was just more with the Edison Park wheelman. If it wasn't for those two guys, the cycling would have really died in the Chicago area. So they kept that alive in the 40s uh, as a sport, and you always had enough people that either weren't drafted yet or would come back on furlough, and they started young kids, they supported, they kept it on going. Now, it was not only in the Chicago area, and I'm more familiar with the Midwest because this is where I grew up, but if you look at Milwaukee, Don Wares was one of the guys in Milwaukee who had the bike shop, was racing before the war, and kept the sport alive there. You went to Kenosha where the dirt track was, there was Don Gill, 
and if you had the Bobby Farr family. So they kept the sport alive during the war. You went down to uh, St. Louis, you had Chester Nelson of the cycling dynasty, you had George Wuchter, whose son was killed in the war, had the Wuchter Memorial Race, Don Rehm, Guarantee Cycle, who was a big wholesaler, supported the bike game. So they kept it alive there. Now Ohio was interesting, Gus Hussey just passed away a few years ago, he was in Columbus, and then not only was Schwinn supporting the bike game in Chicago, but the Huffman family in Dayton. They had the Dayton Cyclecade and all this stuff, Ferris Cyclecade, the rubber company. So there was a lot of activity that way during the war in the 40s, and I have programs and different stuff that will, uh, that. and then in Detroit, you had Mike Walden, Claire Young, Gene Portoese that kept the sport alive there. So that you see that in the Midwest, you had these big cities that were really population and ethnic centers of a lot of Europeans that came in and kept the sport alive during the war through these key figures that were in the cities holding the game going. Now, Chicago was even more lucky in that there was a gentleman whose name was Harry Birds. He worked for the city in the park department and because of him, we were able to get parks closed so we could race in the parks. He even put together venues in Soldiers Field when they had Fourth of July celebrations and stuff. They had the police, the fire departments had marching bands, and they had bike races in the infield, quarter mile, a midget car track, and we rode on this flat quarter mile track, and you were in front of 30, 40, 50,000 people already in the late 40s. And that was a pretty big crowd for us to ride in front when you say there was no activity, we never got publicity. <coughs> and Chicago was really lucky. We always were able to get a lot of press. We always had articles. I've got a lot of newspaper articles from the 40s, and then even my dad had some yet left from the 30s, where we got advertising and racing and all this kind of stuff happening in the Midwest, especially in the Chicago area. And what Harry Burrs was able to do, because he was so interested in the youth and developing the young people, he started the silver skates and the golden gloves, along with the cycling. That was part of what Harry Burrs did in Chicago, and that really helped that end of it, along with Oscar Watson and then my dad in that time. Now, I started racing in 1947, and in 1948, I would, later on when I was on the board of directors and we talked to Otto Eisley and the other fellows that, you know, and that were in the ABLA at that time, they said in 1948 there were only a thousand registered licenses in the entire United States. That included all the officials and their wives, anybody they could sign up. Because you signed the people up as many licenses as you had, that's what qualified you to go to the national championships. So that I might say that, yeah. that, that and that was a stuffed ballot box at, at that. That is correct. Uh, I mean, yeah, like I remember specifically, um, I was hopeful to go attend the nationals as a district champion, but there are only four juniors racing. Yeah. So he's got anybody who had a bike. Right. Come and ride and make it 10, because we have to have 10 to and be eligible could, to go. And you could get three guys to go to the Nationals. If you had less than 10, you could only put one. And that's what they did. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Anyhow, so that, that's how that all worked out. Now, it was funny hearing Harry Backer talk about the guys that went down to San Diego track, and he said they had these hard rubber tires. Well, they were pneumatic tires. Well, they were called, and our nickname was Stone Crushers because they were single tube tires and we called them stonies because you could literally ride over the stones and you never get a flat tire. They were heavy, but they worked. And they were, of course, in 48, 49, they, they were already 10 years old, those tires, but they were still good. So that's, that's what they had to race on. Uh, the soaps, we didn't get the first soaps until almost like 1948 or things like that after the war. And the first year I rode my first pair of soaps, I got two flat tires and my dad wouldn't let me ride for two weeks. <laughs> Blew brand new tires out, couldn't even get any. Well, ran over a bunch of glass. Anyhow, then Peter wanted me to talk about racing comparison, the Canadians and the Europeans and, that, and the road racing, why we didn't have it. Road racing was extent around the turn of the century in that they had a lot of century runs and 50 mile, 100 ride, mile rides, 200 mile rides. But then when the automobile came on and that road racing just kind of died and then the track racing took over. And we were talking about the point scoring system for the national championships. Well, there may be quite a few of you that will remember or know from reading that the old professional championship, Major Taylor and the guys like that, 
they didn't just have a national championship, one single sprint event, they had a whole series of events through the year and the rider that scored the most points was declared the national champion. I think that's how that worked. So what happened was is that was kind of a holdover into our nationals with the ABL of A at the time to where they had a one mile, a two mile, maybe a five or 10. And on some course, depending on where you were in what city, you could even have up to a 25 mile. They gave the ABL of A the option up to 25 mile road race. And then they had the all around championship. Because I remember when Bobby Farr won the championship in 1950, I believe, he did not win one race, and there was a big argument, should he even be appointed national champion without having won a race? But he was a high point scorer, so then it's the way the rules were, so they allowed it, but because he wasn't from the East Coast, there was a lot of shenagling going on. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, he was from Kenosha, so they didn't particularly, but they couldn't do much about that. They had to go with that program. And I suspect that's kind of where uh, that came from with the track racing and the net point scoring system. And what kept us all alive, and Harry talked to this very well, is that you rode everything. As a bike rider, you rode all the road races, you rode all the track races, and you traveled from place to place to place. Milwaukee was 100 miles from Chicago. The guys would come down from Milwaukee in the morning, on Sunday morning, they'd ride a race in Chicago, like at Sherman Park, where Harry Burris had the one mile course closed off. Then we'd all finish the racing at 11, 12, whenever it was. They would then have the races in Milwaukee, 100 miles away, 125 miles away, at 2.30 in the afternoon. So all of us piled in the cars, we drove all the way up to Milwaukee with the guys, rode the races there on Brown Deer Park, which was the Olympic uh, track in 1948 that they put up for the Olympic trials and then we drive all the way back home again that evening, and that's what you did. So that was part of racing. That's how you rode, and you weren't worried about being a road rider, track rider. There was no such thing. And then when you start getting over into the uh, fixed gear and stuff like that, the track racing was basically the king, and because we had no road racing and the European stuff, we were America, we did what we wanted to do, and we were very provincial in that respect. So we kept our track bikes, and as the fellows have said, up until the mid-50s, it was almost all fixed gear. The first time that we had our road bikes was like about 1952 for the Olympic trials. That's where the, that already came in. The guys that were on the 48 Olympic team got their first road bikes. They qualified for the Olympic team on track bikes. They got their road bikes from the Schwinn factory just before they went to the Olympics in London, and they were riding on the rollers on the ship going over to London, training with their simplex derailers on their particular bicycles. That's how the first break-in of that. But still, when you rode a track bike, that was it. 50-mile races, 25-mile races, that's the way it was. And as a result, then, it slowly changed. And now, of course, then, as the time came along, 55, 56, as the Europeans came on, stuff like that. If you wanted to race European style, then you had to do, like Steve and the guys were saying, you went up to Canada and you rode, and there the Canadians always had road racing, 125 miles, 150 miles, Winnipeg, Kenora. I mean, this is a 150-mile road race. You went off the road 20 feet, and you thought some Indian was going to kidnap you. Just take your scalp, because you were in the middle of nowhere. If you got lost, you were gone. You know, that was the end of that. Elgin, I'm sorry? Elgin, Chicago, Chicago was a 50-mile road race. No, no, no Indians. No, Indian. no Indians. No Indians. No, not quite. Not anymore. <laughs> But you did ride fixed gear up the Algonquin Hill. It was a three-quarter mile hill, fixed gear, one speed. And it was great because they blocked all the streets off. And you roared from point to point, and you went down Northwest Highway in these big eight-lane streets at that time, these great big streets we had. They blocked all the traffic off as the fields came through a motorcycle escort with every pack. They were seven minutes apart. Uh, they were usually five packs. And then the guys would catch each other up as the scratch guys would come and pick the guys up. But you went with a motorcycle on the wrong side of the street against the traffic. And then when you got to the intersection, you went a little S and around back on the right side of the street. And all the traffic was stopped at the intersection for the cars to go through. That's the kind of political pull this Erickson Booster Club had all through the 40s and the 50s and then into the 60s. And then it was just so much traffic, they couldn't do it anymore. But that's how the racing was going. And that got big publicity in the newspapers, front page on the sports in the Chicago Tribune. And the Chicago Tribune at that time was, of course, one of the major, major newspapers uh, of the particular uh, United States. Now, if we start just dropping back into the six days again because we're out of this amateur stuff now and how this stuff kept going through the war i'll just transport us back a little bit they, my, they wanted my dad to turn pro because he was a pretty good rider and he were going to give him 45 bucks a day we already had his bike shop 
and at that time, the professionals had to pay for their own tires and for the food and stuff like that. So then the guys were hungry to turn pro because they wanted their name up on the billboard. And then my dad looked at the guys and he says, you know, I got a kid. He says, I got a bike shop. He says, you know, I got to have enough money. You got to pay me 65 bucks a day or I can't ride. And the promoters, you know, Mendel and Chapman and those guys said, well, Ted, we can get these guys for 25 and 35 bucks a day. So we don't need you if you don't want to pay. We ain't going to pay you 65. He says, you're good. He says, you'll get better and then we'll give you more money. My dad says, well, I don't think I'll take that chance. So he, he shined on that. So and then uh, as a result, then he just didn't do it. But the public supported the six-day game all through the time. Then when the war came on, what happened was is that as all the war bloomed and the people got drafted in the army and they joined up with the service or drafted in the Navy, Marines, wherever they did, they were all gone, Air Force, you name it, and then the sport was decimated. And then, of course, I've told you about how the Boston and my dad and now these other fellas all kept the sports alive. And the back in the East Coast and a few guys in the West Coast, there was all a similar situation. Now, when the fellers started coming out of the war, the ethnic clubs had already dissipated because the war did one thing, it was a common denominator. It brought all kinds of people together from all walks of life, and as a result, and when you were thrown in the military, you didn't get discriminated much against anymore in the Second World War, except for the black people. That was still fairly segregated, but all the white Caucasian people, because we were the majority, we ran the country, they were all kind of mixed up. So when they came home from the war, they already disseminated out into the suburbs. As stuff got going, they moved away from the old neighborhoods so that these ethnic groups broke down. And the old timers were still there, but they were getting older and they just didn't have that energy anymore. The young people then went off, wanted to get a job, wanted to get a trade, wanted to get married, wanted to get a car. So everything went to school, GI Bill. All these things happened that kept the sport down. It was still alive, but it was more regular American people coming into the sport at this point in time. So that the at the time, then they tried to come back with the six-day races after the war, and I think 47, 46, they came on with a few. Those were still 145-hour six-day races. You raced 24 hours a day, and they had the 80%, 60% rule, where 80% of the field had to be on the track 24 hours a day, and then you got three hours sleep a night, and then if you then you could luck out and get one or two other hours while the when the infield was. Uh, the track was closed, no people were in the stadium, and they rode slow around the infield and they just counted the laps to get the marathon effect going. And then when the crowd came in in the afternoon, then both riders up on the track, you had the jams, the sprints, the point scoring, you took the laps and all that stuff, and then they had rode for the 145 hours. So then uh, what happened was is that after the war, when I turned pro in 57, they had the last of the traditional six-day races because everybody remembered six-day race, oh yeah, six nights, you know, seven nights, six days, seven nights, and that was it. But then already the Europeans were already going into the derby style racing, which we were doing as amateurs, running seven, eight, nine nights a week, eight hours a day, stuff like that, or two and a half hours a day for nine nights in Delhi, Canada, and places we actually rode as amateurs on the nice big 45, 50 degree, 55 degree bank tracks, riding two and a half hours a night. Well, the Europeans had already started that at running eight hours a day, and then they brought in all kinds of different stuff, different events, missing outs and motor pay, derny pays, and stuff on the basic, in the six day race, because if people wanted speed, they wanted action, they didn't want to see the slow stuff riding around for 24 hours a day anymore. I mean, that's what the 30s, the 20s, the marathon craze of people dancing all night and sitting on flagpoles, the roller, the roller derby, that stuff, that all came out of six day bike racing. You maybe not realize bicycle riding was the big deal. I mean, it was the big deal. It made all kinds of stuff happen in our society so that you have a great heritage and be proud of it and keep it going because you've got a lot to live up to. <laughs> yeah, no. And they got more money than the baseball players. Yeah. They were the highest paid athletes in the United States. Yeah. So anyhow, what happened after the war then, they went to small halls. They were underfunded. When the guys, the promoters came over from Europe, there was not enough money there. They just kept on going. The crowds were small. And after a while, it just faded out. They tried to make it come back in the 70s and that. But it really didn't do it. As far as the influence that 6 day racing had on amateur cycling, it was little or none at all because there was nothing for anybody to go to. We liked it. We loved it. The riders did, or the guys in the 30s did. You could look up to these guys, but there were too few of them to look up to, too few that had that ability to really get to be good bike riders. The guys in their 30s that turned pro for 35 bucks a day, they took a couple spills, they wrecked some tires. They ended up owing the management money, and they were professional. They couldn't ride any more amateur races because Avery Brunners would have killed them. And, and then it was the other deal with the Olympics, but that, you know, that's all kind of contiguous. 
you, once you had your pro, you never got your amateur license back. You know, they were, of course, pure elitists, you know, the upper class society, you know, tut tut and all that good stuff. So anyhow, uh, these guys owed the management money. So then the guy says, well, I want to ride a six-day race. And the management says, well, you still owe me 150 bucks from last six-day. You pay me the money back, and I'll give you another contract. You're not getting any further in the hole. So they were screwed. Their racing career was over. And they, for what? There were one or two races, that was the end of it. They couldn't even get a contract. So that's how they treated the, the bike riders like chattel, like awful. You know, that was really an unfortunate situation, but that's the way it was. So the six-day racing kind of went into demise. It did not help cycling a great deal. What helped the cycling was companies like Schwinn, like Huffy, and then the individual bike shops, and then they kept these races going. The uh, BAR, the best all-around rider, had the races as far as um, they had like 10, seven to 10 races. You went from country to you know, state to state to state. You scored points, they had a great big trophy up for it, and it was really a pretty good deal. And another thing that I was going to mention is that during the time of the 30s, there was a big war between the NCA, the National Cycling Association, and the ABL of A. So the ABL of A actually had on their license, they could have road races and dirt track races. The NCA, the National Cycling Association, which was more the professional guys, they were entitled to all the other track races and motor pace racing. So if you wanted to race, you needed two licenses. And I still have those lights. My dad had a few of those lights, and they kept them, and I got them in my archives so that you know, eventually mm -hmm. someone else will get them passed on. But right now, I have them, and you know, we're asking about that, and I was, it's just right proof positive as to what was happening. So that as a result, and it really was a pretty good effort to keep and get control of the bicycle game uh, in that respect. Now, what, after I turned pro, and I rode the few 60 races here, and the guy just ran out of money. And then I was supposed to get a contract to ride in Berlin, and I, and I went to Berlin, and when I got to Berlin, all of a sudden, you know, I went to the sign up there in Berlin for the sixth day, and the guy says, well, you don't have a contract, you're, you're gonna have to qualify. And I says, well, wait a minute, I says, you know, I says, when I came over, you guys said I was gonna have a contract and I could ride this race. And then the guy says, well, sorry, you know, your contract's not there, and it's, you're gonna have to, it, we'll give you a, a team partner, and if you win this team race, this international team race against all, all the riders, then we'll give you a contract, there's a spot open. Well, then he gave me a guy who was, never hardly rode a team race before, and he was a kind of a road rider, and, and well, that was the end of that. <laughs> I didn't get the contract, so then uh, I was out of the six-day scene, and once, once you're out of the scene, you don't have a team, you're an American, you had all the Europeans they needed, they could care less unless you were a world champion, you could bring them something, uh, we couldn't bring them any more six-day races. There was no quid pro quo, so I was out. So then I looked around and I says, you know, I says this is wrong. I think I went to the federation. I was talking to the guys down underneath the track, you know, the trainers and the coaches. They said, Ted, don't you say a word. If you go up and protest, even though you are right, you will be blacklisted from the managers of these velodromes in Europe. You will never ride another race in the country. You might as well pack your bag and go back home. He says, take it, take your lumps, do whatever you have to do, get riding, and Forget about it. And I says, okay, that was cool. I got the message, so then you just take your lumps, you keep on going. So what happened was, is because I was an American, and I was the only guy in Europe at the time, they wanted, they were trying to bring back motor pace racing. And motor pace racing had always been the most dangerous and the highest speed sport in Europe because it was, it really was dangerous. And you were averaging 35 minimum, usually 45, 50, 55 miles an hour. You're going 60 plus in the sprints when you tried to lap somebody and get around them. And then when they would attack you, you'd start accelerating and then they would be going that fast to get by you. So that what happened was, is, and this was one thing that nobody talked about with our track bike riding when these guys went to Europe. What happened was is that we were able, because we were trained on track bikes, we knew how to sit on a wheel an inch apart. There was literally just enough room to get the newspaper between there, and sometimes you took the print off of it because we knew how to ride our bikes. Guys used to sit in back of the cement trucks like you're talking about. Well, we'd go down to Chicago and on the streets and stuff like that. You'd get behind this big old truck. They had these big fat tires in the back, and there was about this much room between the tires. you try to stick your front wheel in between the two back tires of the truck, see how close you could get underneath that guy's wheel. Well, we were crazy. That's the way it worked. <laughs> you know, if you had to be crazy to be a bike rider anyways. <laughs> so that was part of the fun of it. And because we could ride that good, they said, hey, Ted, you know, we need a guy for a motor pace race. You want to do this? Well, I had never ridden a motor pace race before. And I said, mm -hmm. and then, you know, I got a motor pace bike from Rickard. He had one on the shelf, and I bought it. And then I was in Berlin, and I, you know, this was a little bit later. 
uh, after I got back from, uh, from Denmark. And, and I got in there and I started riding. Well, that was in the, in the, you know, late in 57. And in, in um, I'm, yeah, in 57. And in 57, 50, no, I went in 58, turned pro in 57, 58, I went to Europe. And I was late in 58. Then 59, they had a motor pace school in uh, Nuremberg uh, where they uh, had a track, a big old cement track. And then they actually had for two weeks a training school for motor pace racing. And I was lucky enough because I could steer the bike pretty well and I graduated from the motor pace school and then that put me onto the motor pace circuit. So I basically was able to ride a lot of the motor pace races both indoor and outdoor through Germany and Holland, Switzerland and that I got to ride pretty much. And as I got a little bit better I, was, I made enough money from contract to contract that a guy who was a masseur in Dortmund, Germany, where I stayed, uh, and he said, Teddy, he says, you know, he says, you know, I really love the bike riding, and I you know, was racing. He says, I'd like to be your manager. I said, well, hell, I can get enough money to pay you. He says, I'll do it for free. He says, I make enough money. Massage. He says, if you could pay my way to the hotel and that stuff, I'll just go with you. And I says, okay. So you know, I had a car. I bought a car, and I had enough money for that. And then we just traveled to the different races, and he went with me and got my massage and took care of the, the entries and all that stuff. And that worked out really pretty well. So then uh, I went through that whole season riding motor pace races. And the thing was, is you had to know how to ride motor pace. And one of the vagaries of the motor pace racing was, and all the trainers at the tracks knew how the track was called for because it was stipulated, not officially, but the guys knew this track was good for this gear ratio and the motorcycle had a roller in the back that was really free rolling. <coughs> and if you went too close and you hit the roller, the roller would spin, it went bzzz, it went up like that, so this wouldn't stop you dead and throw you off the bike. Well, every time you hit that, it was like a jar in your legs, you go, and it took you three, four, five laps to get back in your rhythm again. But that you had to ride an inch or two away from that roller if you could, a half inch if you could get away with it, the closer you rode to it, the better wind you had. The pacer in front of you had his uniform, he stood up, he had pegs on the pedals, the his feet were out like this sideways, and he blocked all this wind. And they used to cup their chest like this, and if you tried to pass a motor pacer, or if a guy came past you, the pacers were shoot enough, they understood the vector, the winds and that stuff, so they'd be like this, and then they'd see the rider coming, and they'd go like this with their chest, the wind would deflect off and blow the rider right off the bike. <laughs> the, the guy come back, all of a sudden, whoop, you're five feet back, and what the hell is this, you know? And it, you knew the guy did it to you as you were trying to pass this guy in front of you. Well, that's how, how technical this sport was. Now you gotta figure, you're going 50, 55 miles an hour, there's rollers about this wide, and the different track, different size, different banking, it was so far in back of the motor, it was so wide, all that was determined by regulation, and then the, the trainers knew what gear ratio was best for the size track and for the banking. And then you had to gear yourself accordingly, and then you had to race like it was. And it, the reason I came back uh, in 1960, because they offered me a contract in 1960, or in the end of 1959, that said, Ted, if you want to race, we'll give you a contract. You can race every outdoor track this summer, besides next winter, but every outdoor track this summer in Germany and Holland, we'll give you a contract, you get to race every week. And then uh, before the World Championships, I had taken a really bad spill in Bamberg, Germany. And I was behind a motor pacer named Kess. And you talked about Bill Jacoby. And unfortunately, his wife just passed away. Well, Bill Jacoby was in Europe in 1950 when you guys were racing in Liege. He was there as a professional. 57. It was 57. Well, who was there in 50? Uh, Jackie Hyde was and some Hyde. of the other guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was there in 50. And, and he had raced, and he had the same motor pacer, Kess, in 50 that I had in 59. And when I told him that, he almost fainted. You know, he couldn't believe that. Well, Kess wanted me to win this heat. In, in Bamberg, because it was in the American zone, and there were quite a few American soldiers in the, you know, in the stands that they were watching a motor pace race. And then what happened was the way the banking was, it was so steep when you went up on the track and he accelerated and I was kicking for all I was worth. And then when he came off, there's a little bit of a rise in the track and then it fell down. And when he hit, I had swung high to get on the roller because he swung high, he wanted to go up, take a flyer and come down the track and pass the guy in first place. And we were moving five miles an hour faster guy. We, I know we just went right by him, you know, going into the, you know, the, the last turn. And what happened was is that when the motor went down, it, the motor went, lurched a little bit and it backed up a little bit and I was just, I was coming down when his motor was coming up and stopped. And as I came down, I caught the roller by like a, a, half, a quarter inch. I just touched it and it blew my front tire. I was going about 55 miles an hour. Well, I can tell you that today, and this is over 50 years ago, I can still see 
B, doing a somersault. I'm looking up at the blue sky, seeing my bicycle up in the air. I swear to you, I can still see it in my mind's eye. And I came down and rolled on the track and off the track and into the grass, and I did not break a bone. I was good. I looked like King Tut after they wrapped me up after the second heat. I did. I mean, I was standing there like this, and then Walter Rutt, he was world sprint champion in 1912 or something like that. He was you know, a re really old guy. He was as old as I was. <laughs> now, he was then, he was standing there looking, he has his pocket, and, and I can speak German. You know, and he says, oh, Teddy says, oh, bad spill. He says, you're pretty brave. I says, well, yeah, I, says, I think I'll ride the last heat. I says, I really feel bad, but I got to do it. I said, I signed a contract. I'm not going to quit. You know, you're all nuts. You, know, you got to finish the race. You know, there's no such good thing as quitting. You know, like the guys that rode the Paris for Bay and they fall down, their faces all dirty, and they're all spilled up, broken collarbone. You going to ride next year? This is the worst race. It's terrible. I hate it. God, I, this is a rotten race. You going to ride it? Of course. What else is there to do? You know, <laughs> you know. So it's the same with me. I'm standing there. I'm just, I really look bad. And I rode the next heat, and boy, the guys were going by me like I was standing still. But I rode the race, and at the end, I started coming around a little bit, and then I gained a lap or two back on the guys, but I you know, was down by four or five laps. But that was all right. I finished the race. But then I reflected upon that, and I said, you know, you're a professional, Ted. And I talked to the guys, and they said, when I first came over, because we could handle our bikes so well, we're sitting on these guys all the time. And then the guy said, Ted, just what's wrong? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you sit an inch, two, three apart from the wheels when you're riding the Criterium Serial, and this is a professional. They says, that's no good. I said, what do you mean? Well, he says, if we fall down, we're going to break a bone, and we need to ride to get money. So we got to ride a foot or two off the wheel, otherwise we're not taking too much of a chance. He says, don't ride so close, it's too dangerous. And I says, oh, okay, that made sense. So I thought about that. Don't ride too close, don't take a chance, don't fall <coughs> down, this is your profession. Your daily bread depends upon it. If you were married, you had a kid, you had to support him. This is the way it was. Oh, I was a single guy, that was okay. But I took that to heart and I thought about that after I took this bad spill. They didn't clean my wounds right and I end up with a staphylococcus infection. Well, I had a couple of boils on me that, I mean, were like that. And the ladies will have to, to, to handle this well. I went to the doctor because I was one on my neck and I had one down below on my saddle. And the one on the neck was so tight, I couldn't hardly move, I couldn't sleep. And the doctor, he put this little freezing machine on, he put, he put it on my neck, and all of a sudden it went, poo! And the pus thing just flew across the room. <laughs> I mean, there was a pustule like that, it flew across, like 20 feet across the room, right against the wall. And the doctor he says, that was pretty good, wasn't it? And I go, God, yeah. So, so I thought about this stuff, you know, after that, and I rode the world championships in Amsterdam, and it was bad. I rode a couple of road races in Belgium, and you'd put Pontecane and all this killer, painkiller stuff on your crotch, and you'd rode three, four hours in a road race, 125 more race. By the time it was still 30, 40, 50 miles ago, you were hurting so bad you couldn't even sit on the seat anymore. So then you start riding like that, and as a result, and it got to the end of 59, and I thought about that, and I says, you know, I'm gonna make a couple hundred bucks a week. That was a lot of money, you know, back in the you know, late, late 50s. And I thought to myself, I'm sacrificing my life for the people. And I looked at these guys that were professionals, and half of them that never made enough money to really retire or start a business or had a profession or a trade. They were coal miners, you know, uh, apprentice beat market kids, whatever they did. They were working as bartenders, they were working as taxi drivers, they were working on a track, pumping tires and stuff like that. And these guys were 35, 45, 50 years old. They had nothing, just lived from hand to mouth. Well, that, I thought about that and I said, you know, I've been here a year, year and a half, you know, stayed there for 22 months. And I thought to myself, this didn't make a lot of sense. I'm going to risk my life for peanuts. I wasn't going to be Eddie Merckx or, or, you know, Van Steenbergen and Severines and these kind of guys. I was never going to be that good. I could be pretty good because I went over when I was 26. It was way too late. I actually went over when I was 22, you know, whatever. But then I thought, no, I'm not going to risk my life. I might as well go back to the States and do whatever I was going to do. But at least I still knew how to work. I wasn't lazy. I had all my limbs about me yet. I had a lot of energy, and it all worked out that way. Well, I went back to Europe, you know, se subsequent times, of once the manager and trainer, the world champion and different stuff. But then I talked to Hugo Rickert, the guy who built the frames in Germany, where I bought my motor face bike from and the other, other bikes. And he said, Teddy says, you know, you're lucky. He says, you never got involved with the doping. And um, because he says, all these guys that you raced with, they were really heavy into that stuff. And, um, <coughs> You know, you alluded to that stuff, uh, uh, Ted, uh, back in the, and they said 80, 90% of these guys that you rule with, Ted, they don't live anymore. 
they're expired or they're crippled up, they can't even walk up a flight of stairs. And I thought to myself, yeah, Jesus Christ, here I am, I'm 67 years old, I'm still riding my bike, I can still jog down or around the block with my wife. So I guess even though I didn't win, that was okay. I didn't mind that. I would not take, uh, didn't need that kind of glory uh, to try to get to be a, a fast, faster racehorse rather than a thoroughbred, you see, which is exactly a point well taken. So that the <coughs> one thing we did have, though, by riding and what you guys got in riding in Belgium and all over is that when you went to Belgium, our, it was always known that Belgium was the hardest racing school in the world. If you could succeed in Belgium, you could succeed anywhere. It was the absolute toughest school. The cobblestones, they just beat you up. We rode our road races in Belgium. The horses were given tracks this wide, a parallel set of tracks, because that's how far, how wide apart the horse wagons were, where they carried hay and whatever else, manure, you name it, down the city streets. The rest of them were cobblestones like loaves of bread, just in this big bow, but you had these two strips of cement. Well, the bike racers would come to these towns, you would have two rows of 30, 40, 50 bike riders on this foot, 16 inch wide strip of cement, and wherever you were, you were. You weren't gonna pass anybody. The guys in front were going 30 miles an hour. The guys in the back were going 30 miles an hour. If you went off the track, you were gone. You never saw the field again. And that's the way it was. The roads were so bad, if they didn't have these strips in the middle of the road, the sidewalks were only this wide, because the people's doors came down to the sidewalk, and then it was this wide, and it was a street. When we raced through some of the towns, you, the spectators, the people lived in the houses, would stand in the street. We were racing on the sidewalk on this much territory in front of their doorstep. If somebody would have come out of the door, they would have been killed. The bike riders would have been flat. They would have been an absolute massacre. But that's the way the racing was. But we could do that easier as Americans because of our fixed gear training. And anyone who wants to aspire to be a bike rider could only succeed and emulate that. Ride a fixed gear when you're younger and starting out because the cycling is a sport of speed plus power. It was not a sport of power plus speed. If you didn't get the speed first, you had a hard time being successful because you couldn't push a big enough gear fast enough, long enough to stay with the front. And that's it. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> About who? Tachira. Oh, Tachira. Well, yeah, the, I got named. It, yeah, I, um, I took the four-man team down. It was a number three team because the first eight riders didn't feel like going down in the middle of winter, and we got a team together, Cyril Johnson and, uh, and uh, Barney Dodd. And, um, uh, uh, no, not Barney Dodd. What was his name? Um, oh, Lance... Uh, from, from um, New Jersey, and then um, Tim Kelly, and then who's the guy who's... Um, Emil yeah, Walteufel, Emil Walteufel. Uh, yeah, his, I guess, great cousin or something like that was Emil Walteufel, the composer. At any rate, we took these guys down, and grandfather, maybe, yeah. Grandfather. At any rate, I took the four guys down, and we knew that you want to go down south of the border and drink the water, so I sent these guys acidophilus tablets and got them all going. So we went down. It was a 10-day stage race. At that time, it was the hardest stage, amateur stage race in the, in the world. And there was a Swiss team was there, and we did beat the Swiss team, but that's all because all these South American guys were in the Central American guys were really tough cookies. But it was the first time because I really worked the team. I didn't go out and have dinners and drinking and having a good time talking with the officials. I actually massaged the guys, cooked for the guys. We drove with the trucks. It was a great supported race. And then I brought these guys home. All four guys finished. And it was the first time that we ever had a team complete any major stage race. And even though we got next to last, it was still a victory for the United States and the number three team, not the best riders we had in this country. And the guys really rode well. I mean, Tim Kelly took a spill. He had a knot on his elbow that was bigger than this microphone. And you, you could have pictures of him just walking like this. But he finished that race. We got him through the hills and that, and all the other guys. It was really a great, great event. And I mean, it was really bad. You know, we'd, you'd go to a hotel in, in, I don't know, Santa Barbara, someplace there in, 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 in Colombia. And then the people come up and they say, uh, you can't sleep on the roof tonight. Well, the room is too hot. They have no fans. Everything is off. We're going to sleep on the roof. It's cooler. No, no, you can't. It's a full moon. You sleep in a full moon, you're going to go crazy because the devils are going to come get you. 
This is what they told you. They, and they came up to you in the truck, and they, here's a candle. Well, what's a candle for? You have to light that tonight. If you guys are going to stay outside, you've got the tsetse flies, whatever they had there, they're going to do good sleeping sickness. You're going to have to watch out. The, the, the mosquitoes are going to get you. No water in a hotel. No hot water, no cold water. They ran out of water. The empty tank on top ran empty. So what did we do? We took all the guys down to the river. They were in the nude, watching in the river, uh, half a block away where all the gals beat the clothing with their, with their stones, watching their clothing in the river. I mean, that's the circumstance you had to put up with. That's what you did when you took the teams around years ago. It was great fun. You couldn't trade that experience for no, any money in the sure, world. For sure. I mean, it for just sure. was part and parcel of early American cycling out of the 20s, 30s, and into this, and then out of this grew into the stage of the 70s and 80s, and with guys like Ted Kirkbride and the guys on the board of directors, Al Tofield, and the fellows here at Ernie uh, Soybrednet, and myself, and Bob Hansing, these are the guys that had a pretty good forward thought, and we started getting along with road races and harder races, and then it started going uphill. Then the gas crunch came, and all of a sudden it took off. Bike riding really got to be very, very popular, and it was what is today America, again reclaiming its position as one of the number one cycling countries in the world like it was in 1900. Yeah. Uh. I'm so, yeah. <laughs> I don't need any thanks. Revenge is the best yeah. revenge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, nah, there's no problem. Yeah, sliding over to what? <laughs> oh, no, no, that, yeah. They, 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 yeah, all oh, that, well. <laughs> they, they said, Ted, we'll take the team down and, and we'll give you so much money for expenses. And I said, well, okay, I can do that. So then, you know, I got there and I just spent some money out of my own pocket. And then I came back and I gave them the bill. They, the baby elevator, they owed me like $300 and this back in 1972. Well, it wasn't that any of us couldn't afford $300, but it was just the idea, you promise me the money and please reimburse me. These are bona fide bills for hotels, for food, get the guys down there. So I gave them the bill, but they wouldn't want to give me the money. Oh, well, we didn't tell you that, blah, blah, blah. And I says, okay, boys, I'm gonna stick it to you. And I did. This Chicago boy living in California, ex-pro, done, done in by the gangsters, they ain't about the ABL ain't about to get me. <laughs> so I waited till the next board of directors meeting came to Los Angeles. And then I had them serve the subpoena to go to small claims court. <laughs> and I stuck it to them. And the court trial came up, and Bob Enright was still alive. And of course, he was on our side. He knew it. And he went into the small claims court. And then the judge looked at this. And he looked at Bob Enright. And he says, Mr. Enright, he says, uh, is this claim that uh, Mr. Ernst uh, put out here, is that true? And Bob Enright looked up and says, yeah, he says, it's true. He says, Pay the man, case dismissed. <laughs> and they hated my guts for a long time after that. Oh, God, they couldn't believe it. They just oh, looked at me thinking they want to kill me. And I figured, well, you know what I figured. You know, I gave them the old Italian greeting. You know? No more teams for you. <laughs> no more teams for me. That was okay. I think but it may it also. It is what it was. You know, you, you put the good with the bad, and it was all fine. The guys were good. They just didn't want to pay me 300 bucks. Well, I wanted my 300 bucks. You know? It may also have been at that, that, that same meeting in, in LA, I believe. Yeah. Uh, there were a handful of writers. Maybe Harry was there, Tesla was there, I was there, perhaps Hartman, who were on the board of directors. And because the board meeting was in California that year, some of the East Coast representatives were not there. But but the 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 issue was how do we get away with this damn nationals format? How do we bring international events yeah. in, mass sprint kilometer? And that's kind of when it started right, right. there. And, and I think it was 1965, the first year, where the nationals were more than just the omnium. I, I also have some, some observations about amateurism. Uh, you may or may not be aware that um, the, the Olympic Games in the early part of the 20th century were perceived by most as being uh, an activity for the wealthy elite, well-born, um, to, to which point in some sports there weren't even any trials. People just sort of said, I'm the guy. I'll, I'll show up. Um, that did happen in cycling, even in uh, 36 and, and 48. Um, th th there was a great deal of uh, uh, class social um, issues that determined who should go and, and who should not. And I think that carried over in, into the, you know, this, this fellow we've mentioned, um, uh, what's the Olympic guy's name? Just forgot it. Um, Avery Brundage? He was uh, president of the U.S. Olympic Committee from, I think, 32 to 48. And then for the next 20 years, he was in, in charge of the International Olympics. And at that meeting that um, 
Ted and uh, Harry talked about, uh, was it Jay Lyman Lynch, what was his name? Uh, Jay Lyman something or other, who, um, uh, Lyman, yeah, got, got very critical of, I mean, insultingly critical of cycling, saying you guys are nothing but a bunch of shamateurs. And four years before that, he put uh, aspersions of dope abuse on it. I mean, he just didn't want, they just didn't want to see cycling as a part of it. Because, uh, and if you look at the list of what kind of sports w made up the Olympic Games, it, it was uh, rowing and croquet and archery, uh, lawn bowling, I mean, events that were, um, I think, a different image than, than, than we have these days of what maybe the Olympic Games ought to be. And, and so for quite some years, uh, we felt we had to be pure amateurs. Uh, one little tiny anecdote about that is that I really did feel, I mean, somebody once told me, you had been a newspaper boy, you delivered newspapers on your bicycle. That threatened your amateur status? Um, I mean, I, I kind of believed it. So I was being taunted, I think, by that. Um, uh, Nick, wasn't it you and I who rode in Helmut Stoli's uh, track in 57, uh, maybe 58? Or was, was I can't remember who that was. Uh, maybe it was Hartman. Um, th there was a velodrome in the slaughter yards, slaughterhouse yards, um, in stockyards in, in Chicago that Helmut the Stoli Schubert called the Schubert Stadium. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, pretty crude track, very, very small, very tight. Yeah, uh-huh. As you got near the top, there was a the fan effect. You know. But um, I don't remember who it was with whom I went, but what, it wasn't you, Nick? Uh, well, I, I remember we, we did pretty well in, in a team race they had there. And after the race, um, Helmut Stoli, who owned the track, he, he owned a, a number of bakeries in, in Chicago. And after the race was over, he came over and he handed us a crumpled bag, paper bag, grocery bag. And we looked in it and there was $100. And he said, oh, Mr. Stoley, we can't take money. We're not allowed to take money. And he said, oh, you just tell if anybody asks, well, Helmut, he'd give you a bag of donuts. <laughs> <laughs> and it was at that same year, um, uh, I think Nick and I, in, in Kenosha for, I think, 13 consecutive, was that Wednesday nights, they had a, uh, the, the, the race and on the Tuesday night, Tuesday night and the final Tuesday of the year was what they called Schwinn night where there's a pretty good relative prize list yeah. and uh, 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 I think guys and Trout and Rossi had won every one that season but didn't you and I win that last one the yeah, yeah, yeah. wheel is integrated <laughs> right <laughs> And I think uh, Nick won a uh, used automotive bicycle at that at that race, or one of us did. <laughs> but we were all very sensitive about whether we would be thrown out of bicycle racing by accepting any kind of prizes. Uh, with respect to next year, I don't know if we'll have the energy to do something like this next year, but two topics have, have come to mind. Um, one is the, the history of velodrome specifically and maybe therefore the future of velodromes. And, and I raise that point partly because I, I, I believe that um, part of why so many Americans did so well is because they started their careers in their youth as sprinters on, on the tracks. That might be one to study or an alternate subject might be uh, the 1960s. And I think there's a man sitting to my left who has a thing to say here. Uh, yeah, we have to wind down and be out of here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think I've, I've, I've covered it. You know, there's some wonderful albums here. You, you should not go out that door without looking at them at least. And th it happens off the subject. Um, I put on a race called the Tour of California once, of which I brought some um, uh, programs that if anybody wants one, you're welcome to have one. Yes, Mike. Okay. Um, I know in some clubs, there were, uh, a club had a mentor that would uh, 
and take uh, younger writers under their wings. Um, just to, to make a point though, in the Santa Monica Cycling Club, we'd take in uh, younger riders and, uh, on the coast highway and burn them off. That was our oh, of way of, <laughs> of dealing with them. Uh, <laughs> well, we just see, see how tough they were. Um, on the other hand, um, our, um, our, our mentor in the Santa Monica Cycling Club, uh, Ernie Zamora, he would uh, give us uh, pointers here and there and tell us uh, how to go about it. Um, and uh, I do remember clearly that uh, Tetzloff, since we had no really uh, coaches or trainers, but I remember Tetzloff, um, just su such a simple thing as a training schedule. He, he advised me and others to, to train on Tuesdays and Thursdays and then race on Sunday. And uh, that, that did well for me for many years. Yeah. Yeah, work out nicely. And uh, mm -hmm. Waco in, in our club uh, would organize um, training like rides, yeah. sometimes yeah. against the clock out <coughs> in the Santa Monica Mountains. And that was a big thing for us too. Um, Okay, that, that wraps it up. Dave Waco uh, was largely responsible for the Southern California. Reg Glutz. I ran a lot of calls too, six and eight months, right. but no. Well, thank you all for coming. I, I think we've wrapped it up. <coughs>